in your name. You are the fire that cannot be tamed. You are the power in our veins, our Lord, our God, our conqueror. I will sing into the night. Christ is risen and on high. Greater is he living in me than in the world. No surrender, no retreat. We are free and we're redeemed. We will declare over despair you are the hope. We are more than conquerors through Christ. You have overcome this world, this life. We will not bow to sin or to shame. We are defiant in your name. You are the fire that cannot be tamed. You are the power in our veins, our Lord, our God, our conqueror. Nothing is impossible. Every chain is breakable with you. We are victorious. You are stronger than our hearts. You are greater than the dark with you. We are victorious. We are more than conquerors through Christ. You have overcome this world, this life. We will not bow to sin or to shame. We are defiant in your name. You are the fire that cannot be tamed. You are the power in our veins, our Lord, our God, our conqueror. Our Lord, our God, our conqueror. This is amazing grace. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. This is unfailing love. That you will take my place. That you will take my place. That you will bear my cross. I sing for all that you've done for me. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Hey, good morning. Welcome to Twiggenham. Glad you are here this morning. Thanks for coming out to be with us. If you're a guest, man, we're honored that you're here. Thank you for coming. And there's a card on the seat in front of you. You can fill that out and you can place it. Thanks for coming out. Glad you're here. This is uh, a Sunday that uh, we think a lot about the, well, we think about the cross every Sunday, but particularly this week. And a lot of churches, they call this Palm Sunday. And next week is Easter. And we think about the cross and the resurrection and that whole story and how we uh, think about that this time of year, especially. But th there's an interesting thing that happens in the passage that we're going to look at this morning in the sermon. There's a phrase that keeps coming up over and over in the book of Joshua, which happened hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus. And the phrase is crossing over, cross over. In fact, you should just sometime this week go back and look at Joshua chapter 3 and just underline how many times that phrase comes up. Fascinating to me. And we think about those kinds of transitions where we cross over from one state of being to another. That's what we're going to be talking about this morning and thinking about. And, and it all is pointing us in one direction, to that cross of Jesus. Can I invite you to stand? I'd like to have a prayer with us as we begin this morning and just ask God to bless our time together. You may be in a moment in your life right now when you are crossing over in a moment of transition. Let's take that to the Lord, ask him to bless our time together this morning. Holy Father, thank you for being a God who leads us to new places and into new things and brings new truth into our lives just when we need it. And our prayer this morning is that we will listen. We'll listen for the truth that you want to tell us in the songs that we sing, in the meditation that Charles will share with us later, in the sermon that we'll hear even in the Lord's Supper itself with those symbols of bread and wine. 
God, we pray that we will be aware that all of us are always a moment away from you helping us to cross over into a new way of living, into a new way of being. We give you that praise. We pray for the courage to follow where you lead us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's praise the Lord together. Glad you're here. Hear the holy roar of God resound. Hear the holy roar of God resound. Watch the waters part before us now. Watch the waters part before us now. Come, Come and see what, what he has done for us. Tell the world of his great love. Our God is a God who saves. Our God is a God who saves. Let God arise, let God arise, our God reigns now and forever, He reigns now and forever, arise, let God arise, our God reigns now and forever, He reigns now and forever, His enemies will run for sure. No final word, our God is a God who saves. Our God is a God who saves. Let God arise, let God arise. Our God reigns now and forever. He reigns now and forever. Prince of life, 
He will cleanse our hearts in His river of fire. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold firmly to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who was in every sense tempted like we are, yet without sin. Let us then come with confidence to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to represent men in things pertaining to God, that he may, off, may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to have compassion on the ignorant and on those who are wayward, for he himself is also subject to weakness. Because of this, he must offer sacrifices for his own sins, just as he does for the people. No man takes this honor for himself, but he who is called by God receives it, just as Aaron did. So also Christ did not glorify himself to be, to be made a high priest, but it was he who said to him, you are my son, today I have become your father. He also says in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. He was heard because of his godly fear. Though he was a son, he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all those who obey him, being designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Be seated as we take our offering and as we consider the high priest. We place you on the highest place for you. Are the great high priest? We place you high above all else, all else, and we come to you and worship at your feet. Our reading for communion this morning comes from Luke 24. It's about the disciples on the road to Emmaus. But there's a quote from Benjamin Franklin I'd like to 
like you to think about before we read it. It's believe none of what you hear and half of what you see. Think about that as we reread the story we all know. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them said, by the name of Cleopas, answered him, are, the, you, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened these, there in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went into the tomb and found it just as they had said, but they did not see him. And he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe, all that the prophets had spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all the scriptures and the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if they were going further, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward the evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went to stay with them and was at the table with them. He took the bread, blessed it, and broke it and gave to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did our hearts not burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened us up to the scriptures? As I was reading this, I noticed there is a, a contrast between what we see and what we believe. And the disciples then are no different than us now. A lot of times we do not put the faith first, we put what our eyes see first. And they were doing the same thing. In Proverbs 13, 12, it says, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a dream fulfilled is a tree of life. The disciples would not have been sad or sick at heart if they would have truly and honestly believed what the scripture said and what Jesus had told them over and over and over again. Now, Ben Franklin gave us that po political way of thinking about the world, but there's another way of thinking about the world, and Augustine said this, faith is to believe what you do not see. The reward of this faith is to see what you believe. Now, personally, I choose to believe in the hope that Jesus has given us and to remember and to celebrate the conquering sacrifice that he did for us. Will you please pray for me, praise with me as we pray for communion. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that you've given us to come together as brothers and sisters, and we just thank you for the sacrifice your son has done for us. We can't imagine what it's like to go through what he did to come from where he was beside you and to come to this earth and become one of us, to die for us, to make us whole again. And we just pray that you give us a heart of understanding so that we never let that hope die. We never put anything in front of that hope. And pray that we let our faith lead us, not our eyes, and let us be better children for you and be whole in your spirit. In your name, amen.
Christ we do all adore Thee. And we do praise Thee forever. Christ we do all adore Thee. And we do praise I love that there's two parts to communion, the bread and the juice. At dinner, you get a nice Sister Schubert's roll, yeast roll with some carry butter on it that tastes so good, and then you wash it down with some good sweet tea. I, I mean, it's like filling your belly and then cleaning your mouth at the same time. It's awesome. And it just reminds me of how we get to consume God's word and everything that comes from him, and then it is washed down and renewed in us through his spirit. And it just... It satisfies my heart to think about that, and sometimes when I'm eating dinner, I stare off through the window, and my wife looks at me and says, what are you thinking about? And my answer is usually nothing, but <laughs> it just really makes me happy to think about our soul being fed and then the spirit quenching our thirst. And please pray with me as we uh, continue with communion. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you've given us, and we thank you for your Holy Spirit and how it quenches our thirst and your word that makes our bellies full. And we just pray that we dine on that and use that as our daily bread and to quench our thirst and so that we can give others that bread and spread your spirit throughout the world. Thank you for your son in your name. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> 
great song and a great message. Amen? Let's stand together. <laughs> Love that came for us, humble to a sinner's cross. You broke my shame and sinfulness. You rose again, victorious. Faithfulness none can deny. Through the storm and through the fire, there is truth that sets me free. Jesus Christ, who lives in me. You are stronger, you are stronger, sin is broken, you have saved me, it is written, Christ is risen, Jesus you are Lord of all, no beginning and no end, you're my hope and my defense. And save the lost You paid it all Upon the cross You are stronger You are stronger Sin is broken You have saved me It is written Christ is risen Jesus you are Lord of all You are stronger If you want to go ahead and uh, turn in uh, your Bibles or on your device to Joshua chapter 3, that's where we'll be in just a little bit, Joshua chapter 3. The elders and the ministers spent the weekend uh, with a brother named John Mulliken. John's out of Dallas, Texas. He works with an organization called Hope Network, and they work with churches in a lot of different areas. John is working with us to help us uh, discern a process by which all of us together listen for where God is leading this church. And we had a really challenging weekend this weekend with the elders and the ministers. Uh, And I want to thank you for your prayers about that. We are beginning what's going to be a journey that will take us for the rest of the year, and you'll be hearing more about that. We've got some work to do. The elders and ministers have some work to do before we can um, come to you and and tell you about that process and how you'll be participating in it. But I did want to let you know that we had that meeting yesterday uh, and over the weekend, Friday and Saturday, and the the hearts of the men and women in that room were seriously concerned about where God wants us to go as a church, passionate about that, hopeful about that, excited about that. And so thank you for your prayers, and I want to ask you to keep on praying, and you'll be hearing more about that pretty soon. So just wanted to give you that that update. Uh, 1979, there was a a gaming programmer named Warren Robinette who grew really unhappy with the fact that his work for the Atari game adventure was not credited to him. Uh, Atari management was reluctant to identify their programmers because they were afraid that competitors would steal them. Chance, I guess they were worried that they would lose their oligopoly. That's the secret word the teenagers gave me, so (laughs) oligopoly. Anyway, so what Robinette decided to do was that uh, he, he secretly inserted the message created by Warren Robinette into the game code. And so when a player moved over a specific pixel on the screen called the gray dot, 
during a certain part of the game, that message would magically appear, created by Warren Robinette. He left Atari before uh, anybody found out about it, and he didn't tell them on his way out the door. And eventually, a gamer discovered that and notified the company. And Atari executives were upset about it. They wanted to pull the game, clean up the software, and then re-release it, but that proved to be cost prohibitive. And so the director of software development had a better idea. He suggested they not only keep that message in the game, but encourage other programmers to include little surprises in the future. It would, he said, introduce a new level of interest and excitement in Atari games. And he was right. And he called those little surprises Easter eggs, intentional inside jokes, hidden messages, secret features. And now every game on every platform has Easter eggs. And they show up as well in movies and in television shows. And would you believe in the Bible? We're in Joshua chapter 3 this morning as we continue our series, Faith for Where We've Never Been, which is really an interesting series when you think about where we're headed as a church right now. You can go ahead and, and be looking there, uh, but I, I want you to hear something that Luke reports in his gospel, and Charles read this just a moment ago uh, from Luke chapter 24. Just to remind you, Jesus has risen from the dead in Luke 24, and he's walking to a town called Emmaus with two other men, and the men are disciples, but they don't realize it's Jesus they're talking to. And they tell him about the crucifixion and how disappointed they are because they thought that he was the Messiah. And then I want to go back and hit verses 25 and 26 again. I know Charles read them, but listen to this again. How foolish you are. This is Jesus talking to these guys. How foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and enter his glory? And now this is the part that's really interesting. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. In other words, way back here in Moses, which is the first five books of the Bible, and the prophets, which is Joshua and everything else, there are hidden features surprising connections and aspects of the Jesus story scattered all over the New Testament. And they show up in the light of Christ. They are the Bible's Easter eggs. And we're going to see some of those this morning. So when we last checked in on Israel, they were waiting at the edge of the Jordan River, ready to cross over into the promised land. And they were treading the verge of Jordan as that old song goes. And for us, that was only a couple of weeks ago, but for them, it had been 440 years. We talked about three words that summed up the first five verses of Joshua chapter three a couple of weeks ago. The first word was direction. The people were told to keep their eyes on and follow the Ark of the Covenant because they had never been that way before, which is where this series title comes from, Faith for Where We've Never Been. Every time human beings do what is right in our own eyes, which is what the book of Judges is about. Every time we choose our own paths, it turns out terribly. So direction is as important for us as it was for them. And they were, they were supposed to follow the Ark of the Covenant. I'm going to tell you more about the Ark in just a minute. The second word that we used a couple of weeks ago was preparation. They were told to consecrate themselves, to become spiritually and physically ready to follow God wherever he led them. And that word consecrate sounds so old and dusty and irrelevant, but it's one of the most important words in the Bible. And it's more relevant than we imagine. We, 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 get, we use the example of a young couple that's about to have a baby and what they do in their house to get ready for that baby. They, they consecrate a room. They dedicate a room for a special purpose and they call it the nursery and they paint it and they put the right kind of furniture in there and they protect the wall sockets. They are preparing that room for the new arrival. They are consecrating 
the room. That's what that word means, preparation. And then the third word we used was anticipation. Everybody needs a next, something to look forward to. Everybody needs a compelling vision about the future. And so Joshua tells the people in the first five verses, tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Direction, preparation, anticipation. So let's see the amazing thing that God did. I'm going to read from Joshua chapter 3, beginning in verse 6, and we'll read down to the end of the chapter. It's a few verses here, so hang in there with me. Here we go. Joshua said to the priests, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on ahead of the people. And so they took it up and went ahead of them. And the Lord said to Joshua, today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel so they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. Joshua said to the Israelites, come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you and that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites, and Jebusites. See, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Now then, choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. And as soon as the priests who carry the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away in a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarethan, while the water flowing down to the Sea of Araba, that is the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. And so the people crossed over opposite Jericho. And the priests who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. I drove down to the river this morning before I came into church just because I knew we were going to talk about this and I wanted to see the river. I want to see what it must have been like. And I got to tell you, I think standing at the edge of a flooded river had to be a terrifying moment. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but I'm wondering how many of you are afraid of water. My mother, who's listening right now, hi mom, <laughs> is absolutely terrified of water, terrified of water. When we were kids, we'd go to the beach and she would stand on the beach and do this, too far, too far, and we'd go, is this close enough mom? Because we were right there, right? She was terrified of water. I think a lot of these people must have been really afraid of water because a lot of them remembered personally remembered crossing the Red Sea and how the Egyptian army had tried to follow but had been swallowed up by the collapsing sea. And they thought, man, that, that can happen to us. And even, even if they hadn't been there to witness that event, they'd heard the stories about it from their old timers. And they just spent the last 40 years wandering around in the wilderness. So how likely is it that any of them knew how to swim? None of them. The demand on your faith would have been even greater had you been a priest carrying the ark. Remember that part there in verse 8? God says to the priest, when you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go stand in the river. We read that from the safe and dry confines of our comfortable 600 feet above sea level here in Huntsville, and we think, no big deal. It says the water's piled up in a heap. The town where the waters piled up, piled up was Adam. That was 30 miles away. How long does it take 30 miles of flooded river to drain? Long enough for you to wonder if God's going to do what he said he was going to do. I don't think there's an Easter egg in this part of the story. But I do think some of us are standing knee deep 
maybe waist deep, maybe neck deep in some struggle. And we're wondering if what verse 10 promises is true, that the living God really is among you. For me, and I, I needed to hear this this week, the takeaway is that sometimes God's amazing deeds take a minute or two to develop. The time between the promise and the deliverance is when our faith is stretched and tested. It is uncomfortable. It is unpleasant. We get wet, but it's necessary because that's when we learn what trust really is. That's when we learn patience. That's when faith grows. If you are in one of those moments right now, stand strong. Wait for the waters to recede. Remember the priests waited in and had to wait for 30 miles worth of river to drain. And remember that Isaiah 43 says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. Now you can't read this story and not think about the exodus How God, through Moses, parted the Red Sea and the people walked across on dry dry land. Those two water crossings, the Red Sea and the Jordan, are transitional crossover moments for Israel. And the first one, when when he led them from out of Egypt, God led them from slavery to freedom. And now God is leading them from homelessness to settlement. In fact, for the first time in the book of Joshua, In verse 17, Israel is called a nation. Before this, they've just been called the people. And now they're called a nation. Back in Genesis chapter 12, God had promised Abraham that he would make him into a great nation, and now he has. And if you think about it, these two crossings through water are an interesting hint at things to come. How water symbolizes a moment when everything about a person's identity and purpose and direction changes. Paul put it this way in Romans chapter 6, don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. We we get to make that transition. Israel went from slavery to freedom through water. They crossed over from homelessness to settlement through water. They went from anticipation of the promise to possession of the promised land through water. And you and I experience some magnificent transitions through water as well. We cross over from slavery to sin to freedom in Christ. We cross over from condemnation to acquittal. We cross over from guilt to innocence, from death to life. These these water crossings are one of the surprising Easter eggs, the surprising connections between our story and theirs. And I I just need to say, if baptism is not a part of your story, if that water crossing is not a part of your story, can I just urge you to to consider that and pray about it. We'd be happy to sit down with you and have a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, and open the Bible and see what it says. And, you know, it is interesting that Jesus himself passed through the waters of baptism. Something to think about. Here's another hidden feature in this story. Not just the crossing over, but the Jordan River itself. The Jordan River is mentioned about 180 times in the Bible, and 60 of those are in the book of Joshua. One third more than any other book of the Bible, and that's because the Jordan is not just a river. The Jordan is a symbol for what stands between where God's people are and where God wants God's people to be. And nothing ever captured that idea more eloquently and beautifully than African-American spirituals. They drew heavily from biblical images and themes. Moses, Daniel, Joshua 
are the heroes in the lyrics. So too, Egypt, the promised land, and especially the Jordan feature in those old songs. Like walking Jordan's road, that's a metaphor for living the Christian life. Roll, Jordan, roll. Mentions baptism, death, and resurrection. And then you have probably heard the song, Michael, row the boat ashore. It carries this line, Jordan River is chilly and cold, hallelujah. Chills the body, death, but warms the soul, resurrection, hallelujah. And then there's this one, Jordan River, I'm bound to cross. Jordan River, I'm bound to cross. I got one more river to cross. Mother will be waiting, but she can't help me across. Father will be waiting, but he can't help me across. Jesus, he'll be waiting. He going to help me across. I got one more river to cross. In these old songs and in Joshua chapter 3, The Jordan is the last hurdle. It's the barrier between the people and their new home. And if the Jordan is more than a river, then the Ark of the Covenant, which Israel was supposed to follow through the waters, is more than just a wooden box gilded with gold. The Ark stands for something too. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about the contents of the ark and what they represented. The stone tablets on which the Ten Commandments were etched were in the ark. They represented God's law. Aaron's staff, which was in the ark, represented God's leadership. And the manna, which was in the ark, that flaky, honey-tasting kind of bread that God fed the Israel with, the manna represented God's loving provision. Or to put it more succinctly, the ark and all that was in it, in it represented God's presence which is why in verse 10 Joshua says pointing to the ark this is how you will know that the living God is among you that he is present that he is with you and that's what makes verse 11 so significant see the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth that symbol of God's presence with his people The ark will go into the Jordan ahead of you. The first one to wade into the river was God. And if you'll just hover over that idea for just a moment, the idea that God is with his people and that God goes first, something else might occur to you. What what was it they said Jesus' name was? Emmanuel? God with us. He came, like that song we sang this morning, the gospel song. He came because there was a barrier standing between us and God. A chasm we could not cross. A divide we could not pull together. A river we could not ford. Sin was our Jordan. And just like the priests porting the ark of the covenant into the river ahead of the people, Jesus, our great high priest, was the first to step into the waters and make a way. At the crucifixion, Jesus waded into death and made a way for it to cross over from sin to safety, from aimlessness to purpose, from despair to joy. God told Joshua, tell the priests who carry the ark, when you reach the edge of Jordan's waters, go stand in the river. And I wonder if he didn't say something like that to Jesus when he was in the garden praying for another way. I wonder if God didn't say, when you reach the top of that skull-shaped hill, go hang on that cross. You remember the two men Charles read about and I referenced on the road to Emmaus? They were discouraged. They were defeated They told the unrecognized stranger who'd joined them about their would-be Messiah. He was a prophet. He was powerful in word and deed before God and the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over 
to be sentenced to death and they crucified him, but we had hoped. Can you hear the despair in their voices? We had hoped. They thought the living God was finally with them, and then he wasn't. He was killed. What they did not realize, and what you and I, especially as Americans who are fond of winning, what they did not realize and what we tend to forget is that the cross is the most visceral proof that God is in fact with us. Because on the cross, he's with us in our sin and he is with us in our guilt and he is with us in our tears and he is with us in our fear and he is with us in our failure. He is with us in our forsakenness. How can we know that he is with us? Because he was the first to wade into the river. He was the first to hang on a cross. Don't ever forget that. Because that's how we know. Let's sing together. Who, O oh Lord, could save themselves? Let's stand. Their own soul could heal. Our shame was deeper than the sea. Your grace is deeper still. You alone can rescue. You alone can save. You alone can lift us from the grave. You came down to find us. Let us out of death. To you alone belongs the highest praise. class, there won't be anybody there, because we'll all be downstairs having brunch together. So figure out what you want to bring according to the directions in the bulletin, and join us at 9 o'clock next week, and uh, we'll have a great time together, and then our regular worship at 10. There's no classes this Wednesday. It is spring break. We've got teachers and kids everywhere, so no classes this Wednesday. And lastly, we set a goal a couple weeks ago to raise $272,000 for Ecuador, and we just reached two sixty. dollars so if you'd like to help us finish that out, please just write a check, donate a note on it that it goes to Hacienda, and we'll see if we can finish that up for this year. Hey, thanks for being here. Let's close in prayer. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the beauty of this spring and for the renewal of this earth. And in a similar way, Father, we... We ask you to renew our faith and discipleship. We thank you for, for Jesus and, uh, and his love for us. We thank you, Father, for this message this morning by Jody, for uh, the worship service led by Lincoln, the words from Charles. We recognize, Father, that our lives are filled with transitions, and we're thankful that you're with us in those transitions as we cross over uh, many roadblocks, uh, many hazards, many um, difficult times in our lives. 
Um, we ask you to be Father with the sick this morning, the, especially Farah and Steve Ledbetter and others that are uh, struggling with cancer. We ask you to be with uh, Lisa and Janet who have re recently lost parents and all, all of us, Father, who are disrupted and, and uh, struggling in different ways. We thank you, Father, for all of the men and women of this congregation that are infused with your spirit. We thank you, Father, for, for our parents and for others that have, that have worked so hard to instill faith in us. Uh, we thank you for the stories from the Bible, men of courage and faith like Joshua. Uh, we pray all these things, Father, in your son's name. Amen. <laughs>